to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed theology. My name is Camden Busey, and I'm back in Grays Lake, Illinois, back in studio, and excited for a very important conversation. We've been waiting for this one for quite some time, and uh, looking forward to uh, a good day and a good talk on an important subject. But let me introduce to you first one of our regulars. We have uh, Jim Cassidy, who serves as the pastor of South Austin Orthodox Presbyterian Church in South Austin, Texas. Welcome back, Jim. So good to see you today. Good to be here, Camden. As always, uh, this is a delight and a pleasure to have an interview with you and a special guest. Yes, and thank you for putting this on our radar a while ago, but also for assisting, and, and we're so delighted to have you here to speak with our very special guest today, Dr. Christiana Tietz. Uh, she is a professor for systematic theology at the Institute of Hermeneutics and Philosophy of Religion, the University of Zurich. And uh, from 2008 until 2013, she was professor for systematic theology and social ethics at the University of Mainz. But we're talking today, she is the author of Karl Barth, A Life in Conflict, which is published by Oxford University Press. It's going to be our subject today. Welcome to the program, Dr. T. It's, it's a tremendous privilege and an honor to have you with us. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, we're excited. Uh, we're able to connect uh, over overseas. Are, if you don't mind asking, if you don't mind answering, are you presently in uh, Switzerland or are you uh, elsewhere on the continent? I'm in Switzerland. Oh, Thanks, yeah. wonderful. So this is uh, it's great. We could make this connection and do this uh, in the same day. I mean, even we were just commenting on the wonders of podcasting before our program began today, and uh, just uh, the privilege that we have to speak with scholars uh, around the world about about important subjects. We can't wait to talk about Karl Barth today. And Jim, you and Lane Tipton told me about this book. Uh, it was on your radar first, and and uh, you and Lane both said you could not put it down, <laughs> that you were reading it and just engrossed with it. And the, right when you said that to me, I picked up my phone and I bought my own copy. And I likewise have been enjoying uh, reading through uh, this wonderful title, an excellent title, superb one at that, by our guest today. Jim, do you want to introduce real quick uh, perhaps the book and how you came across it and why this is such a significant contribution to the scholarship before we get into working through its pages? Yeah, I mean, just briefly, uh, I think... I came across it as I do all things on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> it seems that's where I get my my latest news from. And I saw it uh, pop up on my feed and I forget who posted a, a picture of it, but uh, I saw it and thought, wow, that's, uh, that's the volume I've been waiting for. I knew it was in the works. Uh, I had read uh, Dr. Teet's uh, article in Modern Theology back so many years ago. I don't know how many years it was, five years maybe. And so I had heard that she was working on a biography and I was looking forward to it. And when I saw it, that it was released, I had to grab it. So I picked it up and I read it very quickly, uh, which is unlike me because I'm a slow reader, but I read it very quickly. It's well written. Uh, it's, it's even better in its research, its depth um, and its breadth in terms of what it covers. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, there has not been a biography, a full length biography that I know of written by heart uh, by uh, about Bart uh, since um, Eberhard Bush's um, biography and that was for a long time the standard um, but now we have a, a new and updated one and what makes this volume so particularly at least for me uh, so particularly unique mm -hmm. is some new information that has come to light uh, between the publication of Bush's biography and now this one, mm. and uh, I'll save that for Dr. Teets to talk yeah, about sure. here in a moment. We'll but get to that. anyway, um, it's it's an important contribution to the ongoing scholarship on on the life and theology of Karl Barth. Oh, superb! Yes, I uh, that's very well said, and we're excited to open this book up and and talk about it today. Uh, Dr. Teets, um, let's 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 get into it then. In terms of the landscape, uh, Jim just mentioned Eberhard Busch's uh, Life and Letters volume. Uh, certainly, as things come to light later on, and and as more materials are available, and we have the opportunity to reflect, you know, upon the scholarship that has come before us, uh, can you speak a bit about your particular book and perhaps how it relates to, or how it uh, may be similar, or how it may even differ from the books that have come before. What is what is unique, and what what are you excited about uh, being able to publish here and uh, open new areas of of thought and study. 
Well, I'd say that, of course, Ebert Bush's biography is basic for anyone who works on BART. And so it was for me when writing that biography. But since Ebert Bush's biography, 30 volumes of the critical edition of BART's works have been published, which have annotations which say, tell us about the historical situation or about the audience of a certain paper which Bart gave. And I could, of course, use that um, large critical material when writing my book. And Bush could not do that um, when he wrote his book. Of course, he used much of archival material, but I could use it, I could use it in an ed edited versions, which is somehow deeper and, and mm. um, yeah, more detailed than he could have that. And then, of course, Bush was Bart's last assistant. And some people would say that he was um, not only close to Bart, but somehow very close to Bart. And yeah. I'm a little bit younger than he, so I'm two generations be generations behind Bush, which means that I have a different perspective on Bart yeah. than Bush, of course, as his assistant. Had. And finally, I would say what I really what was what what was my interest in writing that book was not only telling historical facts, but also um, trying to understand the human being behind the theology as as good as possible. So I was interested in Barth's thoughts, in Barth's self-reflection, in Barth's critical comments on certain issues in his life. Um, and this was actually what fascinated me to get to know Barth so somehow very personally when writing that book. Um, I wasn't aware what kind of person he was. I, I knew he was funny, but I didn't know how many different layers in his personality he had. Wow. That's really interesting. Um, this is just off the top of my head. So I apologize for doing this so early in our conversation, but my doctoral studies uh, were were focused upon Karl Rahner, another you know contemporary of Barth's, but on the Roman Catholic side. And he also had... Uh, an assistant named Johannes B. Metz, who is who was very influential in Ranarian studies. So it's interesting to me because there are many Rahner scholars who uh, might view Metz's work as important because he spent so much personal time with Rahner, but other people also view Metz with suspicion that he was importing some of his own ideas and using his his personal connection with Rahner to kind of shape and influence Rahner's uh, legacy after uh, Rahner passed away. But that's perhaps a uh, conversation for a different day uh, to talk about theological method and 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 having a pers a uh, historical distance. I imagine there's some advantage for you as well to to be looking at these things with a f uh, several decades of of historical distance rather than looking at them as somebody you spent much personal time with. It goes both ways. There's an advantage. There's also disadvantage. But on that point, I'd, I'm curious more, just more basically, how you became interested in BART as an object of historical and uh, theological study. How were you introduced to, to Dr. BART, and um, when did you begin studying him formally? Um, I was... Introduced to Bart by my most important academic teacher, by Eberhard Jünger, who just died recently, because he was a Bart scholar and in many seminars and lectures spoke about Bart, which made me interested in Bart. And then I wrote my dissertation on Bonhoeffer, who would, of course, be another example for a close person writing a biography on somebody. If you think of Bethke's biography on Bonhoeffer, mm. we have similar complexity at that point. Yet of, and, and Bonhoeffer, of course, was in close um, theological, but also personal conversation with Bart, but both, it was his um, friend, you could even say, and in many important situations in his life, Bonhoeffer exchanged that with Bart and all discussed Bart's theology back and forth. So you couldn't understand Bonhoeffer um, without un uh, being interested somehow in Bart. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so how did Bart's upbringing as a son of a pastor and a the son of a theologian, do you think influenced his theological formation? Well, I think one important thing is the way how he um, was raised as a child, which you could say was somehow a, some kind of a naive way of faith. 
Barth later tells in his Church Dogmatics that he was raised um, by um, by singing children's songs, um, which had a very personal kind of of uh, religiosity. Um, for example, the following Christmas Christmas song, and I just quote that. O little child Jesus in the ugly style, have you come to me from the heavenly hall? Have you come to me and then look for me? And are you my dear little brother? And in these uh, songs, Bart later tells us the stories of the Bible were told as things which might take place any day in Basel, so just, just in the neighborhood. And these songs presented the, the Bible not as myth or something in a far distant um past but as things which actually take place today and which involve me and which have relevance for me and i think this um somehow laid the basis for bard's own piety or spirituality or how you want to put that and, and i would even say for his theology of being somehow convinced about the reality of these stories um on a second level, I think Bart's father was important for Bart's um, pathos for theology and for his um, for, for uh, that theology is the most important thing in, in his father's life, and mm. I think it was the same for Bart. Bart once said that said that the way how his father did this, the quiet seriousness with which he devoted himself to Christian matters as a scholar and teacher, made a great impression on Bart, the son. So I think this um, was also very important, even if Bart later often said that he had a different theology than his father. Um, but I'm not so sure if, if this is really true. I would say they are even closer to each other than Bart oh, later really? in his memories painted that. Wow. He, he painted some distance to his father, but I think it, it would be interesting actually to observe this a little bit closer because I thought that there, there were some elements, for example, that Bart's father wanted to do a theology which had relevance for the parish and for ordinary lay people. And I would say that's the same for Karl Barth, who did not want to do theology only for the academy, but wanted theology for which, which ordinary people could understand. And I think that's also an influence um, of his father. Well, that sounds like a, a wonderful book for you to write one day, or perhaps uh, a dissertation topic that we could we could send out to a promising young student somewhere. Because I'd like to I'd like to hear about that myself. So if somebody, you or another Bardian uh, scholar, somebody wants to do that study, I think it would be well received and interesting. Um, do you find uh, Bart being shaped? Well, certainly he was, but how was Bart shaped by his own education? Where did he study? And after being raised in this home, where did he go off to? And where was he formed theologically uh, in terms of his education? Mm, Bart studied, uh, began his studies in Bern, where the family had moved to because the father was professor in Bern for New Testament and church history. And he also sat in lectures of his father. Um, and then he went to... Uh, Berlin and Tübingen and finally Marburg. And he enjoyed Berlin and Marburg, the two liberal, uh, important liberal uh, faculties at that time. He studied with Harnack, for example, or worked for Martin Brader. He studied with uh, Wilhelm Hermann, who is not an extreme liberal theologian, but um, who influenced Bart a lot. He read a lot of, of Schleiermacher and of course Kant and new neo-Kantian philosophy. Bart himself, at the end of his, um, studies wrote a paper on what he valued um, of liberal theology, what he found important. And he had two elements where he felt that, that he learned that while he studied. He said um, that he was convinced of historical relativism and that uh, so that the New Testament for him was a collection of religious texts like others, which should be explored with methods like other texts. And he also said that he was convinced of religious individualism, so which means that every each individual had to find his own convictions and um, talk about tradition only at points where he became personally convinced that this tradition is worth to be transported to future generations. And this is not a 
um, a few which Bart told later on when he was an old man. That's from a seminar paper which Bart wrote while he was a student. So that's for me interesting that really these were basic elements where he felt these uh, aspects of liberal theology were important for him at the end of his study. So shifting a little bit more to his pastoral ministry, I know before he went to Safenville, he had a, a pastorate in Geneva, but um, but the Safenville um, uh, pastorate was formative for Bart. How so? How did it shape his thinking? How did it shape his his way of life and everything, his view of the world, his worldview and all of that? Well, that's actually uh, interesting. Bart always said that Sarpenby was, which is a small um, working class and farming congregation in the Swiss canton of Argo, that this was, this was the most important change because he was confronted with poverty and injustice in terms of working conditions at the two, um, uh, at the two, uh, sorry, factories in that little town. But interestingly, already in Geneva, Bart was confronted with poverty. And in his first sermon in uh, Saarfenville, he already spoke about socialism. So Bart later told people that uh, it was Saarfenville which made him interested in rich socialism. But actually, if you read the text more closely, you see that this already started in Geneva. So why socialism? Because Bart felt that what socialism at the time uh, demanded and the ideas that socialism had about society, that this was actually the same which Jesus wanted. So the, the justice, the equality, um, that the kingdom of God should be here on earth um, and not in personal spirituality, but in just labor working conditions, in um, just uh, distribution of wealth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Bart found that this was uh, that that richest people should not be um, afraid of socialism, but they should actually say, "Well, we should go hand in hand because we have the same goals." And um, this was not only an intellectual project at the time, but really engaged in societal and and political questions at that time. So, for example, he fought with the son of a factory owner publicly about the situation of the workers in the factory and very aggressively exchanged um, public letters with, with that person. And um, as a very young man already took a, a stance in that issue and said, you are wrong and I am right. And you have no idea about you. You should read books and you should educate yourself, et cetera, et cetera. So this, for me, it was interesting that Bart already here reviews a very um, I say that brave personality, and he was a fighter, and he didn't give in very easily. So, um, in South Africa, you can already realize what kind of man that person was. Wow, he would be a fighter for the rest of his life, wouldn't yeah. he? <laughs> exactly. It started already in Geneva, actually. In Geneva, you also have letters to the whole parish where he was angry that uh, two. Uh, two less men came to the church service and he told he said well that's not enough you are christian you are a member of the church you have to be here and you should not argue against coming and, and he was really aggressive so it's, um, he was always <laughs> very he didn't hide his thoughts about people he always put yeah. it out on, on the front yeah now safenville was where he was uh eventually called the red pastor is that correct because of a socialism yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, sort of moving us forward here a little bit, I uh, wanted to ask about the Manifesto of the 93. Uh, the Manifesto of the 93 was uh, quite important, at least in, in uh, bi uh, Bart biography, in terms of his change in theology. So how did the, the Manifesto of the 93 affect Bart's thinking? Yeah, the Manifesto of the 93 was published in October 1914, so only a few weeks after the start of the First World War, and was signed by not all, but several teachers um, with whom Bart had studied, professors, liberal professors in Germany. And the Manifesto identified, or the people signing the Manifesto identified with the war policy of the German government. 
And I may just quote for uh, for you some sentences from that manifesto so that, that you can hear the sound of that text, which was signed by many, many intellectuals in Germany. Without German militarism, the German culture would have been uprooted long ago. Believe us, believe that we will fight this battle to the end as the people of culture to whom the legacy of a Goethe, a Beethoven, a Kant is just as holy as its hearth and its soil. So you see that they bring together German culture and German soil, German blood, German militarism. And Bart was shocked by that. He also had a letter exchange with his, with his um, teacher, Martin Rade in Marburg, who was not that extreme and Rade did not sign the manifesto, but had similar elements in his theology about God and no, not God, but the, the angels in heaven being happy about the war because there was so much discipline in Germany and people stopped drinking and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And Bart felt that um, a theology which mixes lust for war and national or nationalistic interests and theology and God, that this cannot be a correct theology. So you, when you read the letters from that time, you really can, you really realized how much Bart was shocked by this observation, how how people could identify theology or God so strongly with militarism and war, and and it's not just some war; it's it's a world war. So there's brutalism and horror, and this is what led Bart to really um, question his theological education. And what do you do if your theological education uh, collapses? Do you start anew with reading the Bible? And this was what was Bart did. So he started reading the Romans the letter for, of Paul to the Romans and discussed issues with Torn Eisen again and again and try to start anew. How, how should theology be? And I think the basic conviction at that point was that Bart from then on distinguishes worldly human matters, which really became problematic for the war, and God. So this basic distinction between God as the holy other and any human endeavor, be it culture, be it politics, be it religion, was important from then on. In the, uh, uh, the manifesto of the 93, in the background of that is what is sometimes called the rape of Belgium which was this terrible slaughtering of the Belgian people by the German military. And with oftentimes people don't don't realize that when they think about why Bart was so upset about the manifesto, because there was such terrible bloodshed and to associate God's blessing with such bloodshed was horrific in the mind of Bart. Yeah, that's true. But uh, on the other hand, I think um the letters of Bart at that time sometimes revealed that he was not in all aspects, um, he didn't know all historical aspects, who was shedding blood where, and so the information was a little bit complicated oh, at that point for him. I interesting. Think. Yeah, very good. Um, okay, moving on to um, uh, later on in his life. Now, you're well known in your research about the relationship between Bart and von Kirschbaum. Uh, while their relationship was well known, you have brought to light some more significant details. How did you come across some of the new details? Well, actually, everybody could have known at that time when I, as you said, brought to light it because already in 2000, letters between Bart and Torn Eisen, the third volume was published, mm -hmm. which covers the years 1930 to 95. And this volume included letters in which you could read that there was more between Bart and Charlotte von Kirschbaum and that this caused tension in the marriage between Bart and Nelly Bart. Mm -hmm. So since then, it was not a secret. You could not in 2000 uh, realize the whole story, but you could realize that this was not only, Charlotte von Kirschbaum was not only his secretary. There were rumors before that date already, but in 2000, these 
were published because, and this was always interesting for me, because the children of Bart had decided a few years ago that they wanted uh, these aspects to be published because they wanted the rumors to end. And then in 2008, the first volume of the letter exchange between Bart and Charlotte von Kirschbaum was published, which covers 1925, where they met, when they met and until 1935. And there, in these letters, you can really um, observe the development of the relationships between of the relationship between Bart and Charlotte von Kirschbaum, and that they were deeply in love with each other, but also how many tensions, of course, this caused in the marriage uh, of Bart. So it was, I didn't really reveal a secret. I think many German readers already knew about that. Maybe not men, not all Americans knew about that when I sure. published on that. And certainly having it now in a in a, the form of a biography gives us fuller context in a more it's more succinctly put rather than having to be someone who is picking apart the letters so i think your presentation has made it quite helpful to understand the nature of this relationship in a way that someone who is just casually reading or trying to understand bart might not necessarily have that access let's go ahead and and get into it a little bit tell us more about um how Bart and Kirschbaum, uh, von Kirschbaum met and how they fell in love. They met in summer 1925 at a vacation house um, close to the lake of Zurich. Um, and they really quickly fell in love with each other. They exchanged some letters in which they already speak very personally. And then Charlotte von Kirschbaum visited Bart in Münster in February 1926, a few months after they had met, where he, he lived already in Münster while the, his family was not was still in uh, Göttingen. And after that visit, it was only a day, they told each other that they had fallen in love. And it's interesting that Bart at the very beginning thought that it's enough to that they had, had told this to each other, but it was clear for Bart at that point that there would be nothing more, that the relationship mm. should not develop in any further direction. Mm. So in the first love letter which Bart wrote to her, he, tr he tried to be honest with Charlotte von Kirschbaum and tried to, to, to draw a realistic situation in which they now were. And I may quote Bart here. Now we must think of the present and the future if we were both single. The discovery that has now been irrevocably made would be one of those moments of spring, joy, and life with which God sometimes blesses us foolish, wrong-headed creatures in the midst of our darkness. As things stand, this same discovery is a moment of pain and renunciation. And only a few days later, Bart told his wife about that, and he hoped that they he and Charlotte could just remain special friends, but nothing more. But then after a while, Bart realized, so they still exchanged letters and met from time to time, but not very often. But Bart soon realized that he couldn't live any longer without having Charlotte close at her side, at his side. So in 1927, she started working for him, um, supported him in his theological work, and then he missed her so much that in January 1929, he suggested to her that she should move into his home. She should continue to work with him, but for the outside, one should just speak of her as his secretary. Mm. And in that, only a few weeks, Bart confessed to her just that you can um, sense how important this was for Bart. He, he wrote her in a letter, tell me what is this that we now can almost no longer exist without one another, that even from far away there is such an attraction and is nowhere more comfortable than with the other, and in fact so close as possible with the other. I never knew that there could be something like this. Of course, Nelly Bart was not happy about that suggestion. Right. Um, she considered a divorce at that moment. 
but she also tried to understand Bart. And so finally in October 1929, Charlotte von Kirschbaum moved into the family home in Münster and from then moved with the family for, to, any, to every new place. Hmm. So for almost 40 years, they lived in a so-called so Notgemeinschaft, as they called it, hmm. which you could translate as an emergency community or necessary community, but also a community full of trouble because it had both, both aspects. It was necessary because Bart felt it has to be, but at the same time, they really suffered under that uh, triangle or the way they right. tried to solve it. I'm, I'm interested to hear more about um, Karl Barth's wife, Nellie. Now, obviously, there's there's so many important things going on. They're married. They also have children. But uh, up until this kind of permanent, more permanent triangle, there were seasons in which Bart would go on vacation. Would, wouldn't he be gone for maybe a month at a time and he would spend a month with Charlotte somewhere? And that would be understood by his wife or he would be traveling around and then come back and spend time with his kids. And how did that, I mean, what, what were some of the mechanics of that until they finally resolved upon this emergency community? Well, um, I think for Nelly at the very beginning, it was a situation that she felt, uh, and this is very sad, that she felt she, she was somehow guilty that Bart mm. fell in love with Charlotte von Kirchbaum. So she, she very often asked herself, why can I not be the woman, right. his only woman? What is wrong about me? What right. can I do better? What how can I... Um, Help well, him to to love only me. Yeah, why um, why is he looking elsewhere? It, exactly. it must be some what, what is, insufficiency. Is right. Yeah. That's so sad. Yeah. yeah. And and of course she, she tried to enjoy the time in which he was present, but that was, this was also um sometimes of course with, with tensions and yeah. um so I think it was a very yeah. She, I think she somehow accepted it, but at the same time, and, and then of course she, she felt that because she's married to Bart, um, this is something divine. So this is a divine order and um, we are, we, this should work out because God somehow right. <laughs> established has a sense it. of right. it. So it's, it's a very complex perspective which she had. Now, she also would have conversations with Charlotte at times. How was that? I, it, it's so strange to me in in a sense, and I was fascinated by reading this section of your book because I'm trying best to understand them on their own terms, to understand the personal, their feelings and their social circumstances, which are melded with their cultural issues, as well as t to some degree, the theological issues on marriage, but also Bart's dialecticism might come into play a little bit. But what struck me the most was just how how Charlotta and Nelly corresponded with each other. And eventually, like, you see pictures of them together. And it's just hard for me as an outsider to think how could they even live in the same house and not resolve to to violence? I don't I don't know. And and that is what is so intriguing to me from one perspective, but also I, I maybe the better word is perplexing. I'm curious what you found in, in the letters. Are there any disclosures of, of Nelly in personal correspondence, just in what this is, or any indication of what, how she related to Charlotta, you know, in, in just on a day to day well, basis? Mm, or were well, they always in separate rooms? One problem which yeah. we, sorry. Oh, I should sorry. say, were they, were, they, were they hermetically sealed from one another? It doesn't appear so because you see photos of them together. Yeah, I think one one problem which we have when discussing that is that Bart decided that Nelly Bart's letters to him and his Bart letters to Nelly Bart should not be part of the of the public estate. So um, we know many things about Nelly Bart, not in her own words, but from 
but reacting to a letter of Nelly and writing to somebody else, etc. So um, we have only very few letters where we hear Nelly's own voice. For example, when Nelly writes to another friend or when Nelly writes to Karl Barth's mother, which she did very often. And there you can, can sense how how she's struggling to, to find a way to deal with that. Um, I think both Nelly Bard as well as Charlotte von Kirschbaum try to be somehow friendly to the other woman. So they really felt they should it should somehow work work out because yeah. there was this problem of bar of not not trying a divorce. Right. Because Bart always said, I can only divorce from Nelly if Nelly agrees to that. Mm. So, um, and then of, on the other hand, of realizing that Bart cannot let Charlotte go. So, this was somehow a constellation where they had the feeling of it, it somehow has to work, but it, it was really problematic. It, there were ups and downs, but a few weeks where it was a little better, but other weeks where it was really right. uh, problematic. And I think the one solution was that they, had different um, tasks in the household. So it was clear that the, the cooking and caring for the children, etc., was mainly Nelly Bart's duty and supporting Karl Bart's work and helping him with the letters was mainly Charter von Kirschbaum's. Mm. Uh, I, you know, I, I used to have, this is a tangential, but it's on the point. It's really the case... I used to have a supervisor, a German supervisor in a previous life when I worked in a corporation and we would always joke about idioms. So sometimes I would, I would take German idioms and translate them into English and use them in the workplace, but they make no sense in English. So he would always be very confused. So I would say, you have a jump in the dish, or I hear peeping noises, these sorts of things, you know, if he said something, or if a meeting would come to an end, I'd say, uh, everything has an end, only the sausage has two. These are just things you don't say in English, but I'm sure you're very familiar with all of these sayings in, in, mm. um, in, uh, in Deutsch. But in English, we have a phrase, damned if you do, damned if you don't. And it seems as if Bart maybe felt as if he was in this position. There's no way for him to win or to have success because of his relationship with Nellie, her unwillingness to find a divorce, but yet his incapability to live, um, you know, with Charlotte. And even if he were to leave and go live with her, then he's in a sense, sacrificing his family. He's just, you, you feel that tension in his letters and just that pain where from his perspective, you know, whether, whether, you know, it's all easy for us, maybe easier for us to look on someone else and come up with, you know, our own take on the situation, but just on his own terms, they, they all, all three of them seem to just be living in this, this impossible trap. And no matter which way you went, there's just terrible pain. And you feel for them just as humans, uh, just it, it, the, what they're experiencing, whether that was you view them as, as at least Bart maybe is deserving it for getting himself into this or, you know, just to refrain on judgment. Re, we can all recognize the pain they were in as disclosed in these letters. I would totally agree. Mm. It's, it's re a real tragedy. And I think the, the same would be true for the two women that they, they always they again and again try to find a different solution. And then always realized it would not be, it would not be better. So Bar some at what some point said it is the. I don't know the wording in English, but this uh, is the am wenigsten unvollkommene hmm. Lösung. So it was. It was. I think it was for all. For for everyone was it was clear that it's not. It's not a good solution. Yes. It's, it's not. They didn't solve the problem. They just remained in that situation of tragedy and and try to survive mm. it day yeah. by day i think one one important or maybe more optimistic th uh, thing is that people who knew them in their later age they were they told that it, when they all became older it became more quiet and they somehow find an, found an arrangement which mm. made it more peaceful and then finally Charlotte von Kirschbaum became sick and had to move, move out in 1966. And it is, it is told that then um, the situation at home became 
somehow harmony again, or mm. that Bart and Ellie Bar found a new way um, as a couple to to reconciliate, right. uh, re reconcile with each other, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the question that comes up in my mind, next question is how did Bart as a minister and as a theologian justify this arrangement when it was so very hurtful and, and damaging, especially to his wife, Nellie? How did he justify it? I would actually say that he did not justify the situation. To close the friends and family, he, all, he very often spoke about the guilt, which that consolation meant. So um, he was, for example, very grateful that his children, um, or his contact to his children remained intact. So uh, even though he put so much harm on Nelly Bard. And I would even, I'm even wondering if the importance of grace in Bard's theology um, somehow stems from that from that experience that Bart really was aware I see. that he was guilty here and that he needed God's grace in a very concrete manner. If you, if I may, I would like to read a, sm a small passage from a letter which Bart wrote in 1947. So mm -hmm. more than 20, more than 20 years after he had met Charlotte von Kirschbaum. Mm -hmm. Please. In that letter, he summarized how he viewed himself and his relationship to the two women and what this meant for his theology. The very fact that is the greatest earthly blessing stowed upon me in my life is simultaneously the harshest judgment against my earthly life. So I stand before God's eyes without being able to escape God in the one way or another. It's entirely possible that because of this, there is an element of experience in my theology or better put, an element of lived life. In a very concrete manner, I have been forbidden to becoming the legalist that under other circumstances I could have become. That That's remarkable stuff. And we could spend a whole lot of time unpacking so much of this, but I wanted to move, move forward if we could. And we don't want to disclose too much because we want people to buy the book and read it for themselves and um, get imperative. some more information yeah. from the book. Uh, but let's let's move on to uh, to the Nazis. OK, uh, tell us a little bit about the church struggle that was going on in Bart's day. Tell us a little bit about how Bart would protest against the Nazis attempt to try to control the church or take over the church, especially with um, with the clause that was going to be put in their book of church order about a um, a Reich bishop and such. Tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. I think um, the first important thing here is that Bart was really against the ideology of the German Christians, which was an ideology which you could find within the German church. It was not a political uh, structure. It was an ideology within the German church. The German Christians were a movement founded in 1932 with the goal of creating space for the national socialist ideology and thinking within the Protestant church. And they had the feeling that, and, and they, um, in the, in the, sorry, in their founding document, they argued that race, ethnicity, and nation orders are entrusted by God, and that God has commanded human beings to preserve these orders of race, ethnicity, and nation. And so they argued for this reason, race mix mixing must be opposed. We are conscious of Christian duty toward and toward and love for the helpless, but we are we also demand that the people be protected from those who are inept and inferior. So it was a really, um, you might say, Nietzschean uh, ideology at that point. And they said race, et cetera, is important for us. But it was very convinced that this ideology is not Christian because he, and he argued that in the church, these should not be criteria, but in the church, uh, everybody belongs to the church through the Holy Spirit and through baptism and not through blood or race. So he, ver he was ver strongly opposed against that ideology, which, which was not true for everybody 
who later belonged to the confessing church. Some members of the confessing church were only against the structures which the national socialist state wanted to put on uh, or, or uh, the, so, so the the Gleichschaltung, the structures which they wanted to have within the Protestant Church, but Barth always fought against that um, ideology, that racist um, ideology. Um, Barth in 1933, so a few months after Hitler became chancellor, published a small text which has been misunderstood quite often, theological existence today. It has been misunderstood quite often because Barth in the texts at the beginning says, uh, now we should do theology and only theology. But if you read the text carefully, you should you, you can realize that it's really a protest text and not just a uh, isolated theology project which Bart promotes in that text. Bart says in that text that um, even in a totalitarian state, the church is the boundary for the state um, and that the church cannot be hibernated and it cannot accept being conformed to the state and Barth sent this text actually to Adolf Hitler with a letter um, saying that Hitler should be informed about a Protestant understanding of the church and that Barth begs for uh, forgiveness that he has to inform Hitler about that has to inform Hitler about that this is on the on the level of producing text but Bart on the personal level also um, refused to give the Hitler greeting in his lectures, which was at that time demanded by professors in Germany. Or in November 34, where all the public servants in Germany had to swear an oath on Hitler, said that Barth said, I could only swear that oath on Hitler, which was, um, I swear that I will be loyal and obedient to the leader of the German Reich and people out of Hitler, obey the laws and fulfill my official duty conscientiously, so help me God. Barth said, I can only swear that out when I can add after loyal and obedient, so far as I can answer for this as a Protestant Christian. So Barth wanted an, a limiting addendum to that oath, which of course was not um, allowed for him, but he said, I can only do it that way. It, it, there was a criminal process against Bart, disciplinary criminal process against Bart, which at the end led to Bart's dismissal. Which for me it was interesting because it showed that Bart really, um, of course, he was Swiss and could go back to Switzerland, but there was some risk which he uh, undertook to be clear in his position. Hmm. It's interesting to see Bart, uh, his opposition to the, the Nazi party, significance uh, in these things. It reveals something about his, his sense of uh, morality and justice. We see that also somewhat in his, his influence uh, regarding the Barman Declaration, which very basically uh, defined the Christian opposition to any interpretation of Christianity based on racial theories. What was Bart's role in that declaration, why is that an, a significant thing uh, or a significant disclosure for us to understand something about Karl Barth? Barth wrote the draft, mm. uh, the first draft of the declaration, and was uh, strongly involved in the process for the finalization of that of the draft, and was present at the Barman Synod. He didn't speak there um, publicly, but uh, you can really sense that this. Bart's pencil who shaped the decoration. For example, if you have a look at the first pieces of the decoration where uh, the Christological focus which Bart in his theology has comes very clear or mm -hmm. is, is very obvious when it says Jesus Christ as he is attested for us in the Holy Scripture is the one word of God which we have to hear and which we have to trust and obey in life and death, which meant there are no other words to which we should listen only to Jesus Christ as the one word of God. Thanks. So, wow. Um, this has been, I mean, this has been great and so much more can be covered, but really um, we want to urge our listeners to just go ahead and, and read the book for themselves. Uh, as they say, the book is better than the movie. 
uh, <laughs> the book is better than even our time here together. So, um, but just to wrap up, uh, closing, uh, kind of uh, kind of a wrap up type question. What are the lessons that we can learn from Bart's life uh, today? So, you know, what what's the takeaway? What is the application? Knowing as you do so much about Bart's theology and his life, what are the big lessons that we can learn for today from that? Well, I think one aspect, of course, is that Bart was, as I said at the very beginning, a brave person who fought for his convictions with arguments um, and with with um, and not only in, in, in one moment, but also in the second moment and, and on long durée, so to speak. Um, he fought for them, even if they were in common sense. So he, I, I often had the feeling that he wasn't afraid that he would be the only one who would put that uh, point on the table. What was interesting for me uh, when reading Bart was understanding that he was not against state as such or so. He was not a protester for the sake of protest. He was always very aware, maybe especially as a Swiss person who grew up in a democracy, that you have to differ, uh, distinguish between protest in a totalitarian state, which is necessary because to, this, a totalitarian state is in conflict with the first commandment. So if somebody like Hitler um, says, commands us to do something, then it is, this is seriously a religious issue because this is against the first commandment that mm -hmm. there is only one God. Mm -hmm. But in a democracy, protest has to be different. So Bart would distinguish between um, a protest, which we can um, pursue in a democracy as our right, but that should not be mixed up with protest against a totalitarian state like it was natural socialism. Mm -hmm. On the level of theology, I would say what I love about Bart, to be honest, is that Bart understands theology as speaking about God, mm -hmm. and that this should be the main duty of theologians, not only speak about cultural achievements, not only speak about uh, religious practice or religious concepts, but really try to speak about God, which for mm -hmm. Bart, of course, meant that because God is so different from human beings, uh, theology has to start with God's self-revelation and not just with human fantasies about how God right. should be. And Precisely. that's what I think is, is still of importance for theology today. Well, I certainly agree with that. And I appreciate that a great deal and uh, appreciate also your time with us. But just to, to reiterate something that came up before, Alice had ein Ende nur die Wurst hat zwei. So I think we would, it might be time to uh, to say adieu. But thank you so much, Dr. Tietz, for joining us today. And thank you even more for writing this book. It is a tremendous contribution. And we appreciate you taking your, your valuable time and spending it with us this afternoon, this evening. Thank you. Uh, we very much encourage you to pick this up. Carl Barth, A Life in Conflict by... Our guest, uh, Dr. Christian Tietz, uh, it is published by Oxford University Press, and you know them. They do tremendous work, uh, just top-notch uh, work. And we're also very thankful, not only for the scholarship you're in, but also the translation work by Victoria Barnett. And uh, it's it's very readable. It's just a tremendous, a wonderful volume, and you're going to enjoy it and um, learn from it as well. So if anything we've discussed in this last hour has piqued your interest, certainly get a copy of the book. We'll have links available in the episode description. Of course, we are online at reformedforum.org, where you'll find information about all of our programs, our uh, online courses and uh, events coming up, and uh, ways to get in touch. If you have any questions or comments, please write in. Uh, we'd love to interact with you. But thank you so much for listening, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center. <laughs>